The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so those were all really great presentations. Thanks, you guys. Um, I'm excited about all the projects you learned about and things you accomplished. Uh, so now, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, what we're going to do is very quickly go through the design process and then talk about the entire remainder of the class. And part of that will be you guys down selecting from the projects you've just discussed to the top few that you think are good candidates. And then tonight, everyone in the class will let me know through in a survey what you want to actually work on. And then you'll be assigned into your final project groups on Friday. So um, last year, some teams wanted to work with the same community partner. or all wanted to work together. And other teams wanted to do something different. So there's opportunity for um, change or not change, depending on what you want. Um, so basically, uh, Doing design and the design process is challenging for some pretty standard reasons of you have these really severe trade-offs between, uh, you know, you want a material, something that's really light but really strong, et cetera. Um, it can be a very dynamic process. There's a lot of things happening at once. Um, there's a lot of details to worry about. There's always time pressure and there's always economic pressure. And that's um, even more true when you're doing design for um, developing countries. So you need to know your user um, w and understand the need, which hopefully you've just addressed in your trip. But as, of course, in a week, you're not going to truly fully understand everything. Um, there can be ethical concerns that come up that are more severe than they are um, at a typical corporate design issue. Um, and there's some pretty extreme design constraints in terms of the costs and the robustness. And um, is it usable? Can you manufacture and distribute it? Um, and then also transparency. Is it easy to fix? Do people really understand how it works? Can be even more important. Um, but it's all super rewarding, too. So it's worth doing. Uh, and so there's a lot of different ways that people uh, consider the design process. So this is one way of looking at it. So first you gather information, which you just did hypothetically, and define the problem, which you are doing or just did. Um, and then you create design specifications, which you're doing uh, this week, um, generating ideas, evaluating your concepts. Um, doing some sort of analysis and experimentation to really learn what you're doing, uh, doing detailed design to get it, work out all the details, fabricating, testing, and evaluation. So that's one way to think about it. Uh, another way is uh, to think about it from more of a staged st standpoint. So you start with your planning, and then you get mission approval. So thinking about it that way. Friday is mission approval. <laughs> um, and then you do your concept development, and you have a concept review, system level design with a, another review, detail design, another review, testing and refinement. And then you're approved for production and can hypothetically do production. Ooh, there are some crazy controls here that I did not put in, but clearly came up. <laughs> um, so I tried to just map how these two approaches work um, and how they connect. And of course, there's actually um, other ways of describing the design process. Um, and these all interlink. And I'm not going into these in a lot of detail, but we're sort of going to just go through this in the class if you haven't seen it already. But another one to look, about, look at is your functional requirements. So what does design have to do? And then how is the design going to meet the requirement? Analyzing any decisions and figuring out what you're doing. Um, doing the research to make sure you're not building a better mousetrap when there's plenty of good ones out there. Um, the risk, what's going to happen if things don't work out. And then your countermeasures, what if things don't work, what do you do? Um, and this is from Alex Slocum, and he likes to use <laughs> language that I don't always use. <laughs> um, this is from David Wallace, who's another design professor in mechanical engineering. So all of these me methods I've talked about all seem relatively linear, 
which is a lie. <laughs> um, so one way that David likes to show is that the, you're always considering your economic, your physics, and your a analysis, but you start out with very a lot of breadth and very little depth. And then as you go from idea to concept to detail, you get much more depth and much less breadth. But you're always sort of cycling through all of the steps. So similarly, this is another way of looking at it. So you, right now, we're going to be doing pew charts to figure out your projects. And then once you figure out your projects, you're going to do more project, pew charts to figure out what your implementation is. And then when you figure that out, you're going to get all the way down to like figuring out, am I going to use a screw or a nut, or I mean a screw or a bolt with a nut to connect these things, like a wood screw or a nut and bolt. Um, and so each time, you're winnowing down. And so you're repeating a lot of the same things. You're going to have to go back and do research. It's not like you get to do research once at the beginning of the class, and you never have to investigate anything again. It's just the level of depth versus breadth that you're considering. Um, I talked about this a little bit previously in the charcoal project and how the press evolved. But I just wanted to emphasize that our class is getting to like, hopefully getting to a really good prototype. and. Sometimes students have in mind like that's the ends process, and that's not the best way to think about things. So if you think about, say, an iPod, it started out ten years ago um, with one iteration, and that was you know a production product that had had many prototypes ahead of itself. Um, and now, if you think ten years later, not only does the iPod itself look really different, but there's also all these other implementations of the iPod that are out there, and um, many, many devices along the way to get there. Um, so that's just a true. And e this iPod is an obviously complex example, but something even as simple as a Netflix envelope in seven years has gone through a ridiculous number of design changes and improvements. So it's just a reality of the design process that you're always getting to the next, to a good stage, hopefully, but you're not ever getting to, you know, you, you can't think that your first prototype, like the orange juice bag sealer, is a great example. You delivered it. It made sense a year ago for being checked a 12 volt battery, and now you can't find any, and it has a different need, and there's other needs coming up. So there's always going to be optimizations. OK, so I want to go over a Pew chart today, because that's what you're going to be using. Um, if you haven't seen it, Pew was a guy who came up with this method. Um, and so it's just a way of comparing different ideas. It seems, in some ways that you do it, it seems like it can be kind of quanti quantitative, and it's absolutely not. It's an entirely qualitative method, and using it quantitatively is sort of defeating the purpose of it. So what he, um, the way you use it is you have a bunch of criteria on your left vertical axis, and then a bunch of options that you compare. I always pick the bad marker. A little better. Um, and so today we're just going to compare a nail to a, um, a ring shank nail to um, a staple and a screw. So when you're doing a pew chart, you're usually doing it in a group. And so it's a good idea to make sure that everyone knows what each of these options are. So it can be helpful to draw like a really fast, simple diagram just so that everyone you're sure has in mind what the differences are. So if you don't know, a ring shank nail is somewhere between a screw and a nail in that it has little rings on the edge so that it helps prevent the nail from popping back out once you dr drive it in. But you still drive it in like a nail as opposed to screwing it in like a screw. Um, And then a staple, obviously. So it's nice to have a drawing as well. And then you need some criteria uh, for how you're going to compare all of these options. And so you just go through um, what you think are the most important ones. Um, there are more complicated charts that sort of are uh, versions of pew charts where you can put different weighting on your different criteria. That gets really hard to do, especially as you have more criteria. Like, how much more important is holding than effort? Like, it gets a little complicated to figure that out. So sometimes, because this is so qualitative, just having these out there and then keeping in mind your mental weightings is sufficient. Um, and so th then you want one of your uh, 
items to be your standard. Um, so this is really important uh, that you just pick one that you think might be the most standard and just give it an S for standard or zero or whatever, whatever you want to use. Um, it's tempting not to give a standard, right? Because it's kind of annoying. Like it might mean that on some, like the, if the nail is the cheapest option, then your standard, everything else is going to be more expensive. Everything else is going to be off the chart. So it's not actually in the middle, which is what you want. However, you always need to compare to something if you're just, there's, because there's no like neutral. So you have to define your neutral. So this is the way they do that. So it, while it's tempting to not define a neutral, it makes the pew chart a whole lot more useful if you do. Um, and then you can just go through and grade them. So a ring shank compare in terms of rate. And some people like to go down. Some people like to go across. It's sort of whatever you prefer. But so a ring shank is about the same speed. A staple is faster. A screw is probably slower. So that's just how you do it. Um, for cost, a ring shank is going to be more expensive. And that's another confusing thing. Like more expensive seems like it should be a plus, but it's actually a minus, right? Because that's worse. A staple will be cheaper. And a screw is going to be more expensive. Um, for holding, a uh, ring shank is a little better. A staple is a little worse. A screw is a whole lot better. So you can do minuses and pluses. You can do ones and twos. If you do ones and twos, again, this is qualitative. Um, so no adding those numbers at the end. Um, and for effort, uh, a shank is similar. Uh, a staple is probably easier. And a screw is harder. So yeah, so as I said, a lot of people are then tempted to put a line at the bottom and be like, all right, this is a 0, this is a 0, this is uh, a 3, and this is Um, which is not the way to use a pew chart, so don't ever do this. <laughs> um, and the reason is that, again, there's different qualities um, for there are different weightings for all of these things. So that adding these up isn't that meaningful and isn't a good way to make a decision. But it does very quickly help you determine, um, you know, just looking what are the pros and cons of each one in a visual way that's pretty fast to really think about the pros and cons and make sure you're actually considering the pros and cons that are important to you. And then finally, um, if we didn't have the ring shank here and you saw the nail and the screw, the pew chart is something that might lead you to develop the ring shank um, where you're like, okay, the screw is slower and the cost is worse and effort is worse, but it, holding is really good. What could I do that would combine my screw with my nail to get me a, a better product? Um, and that would, might lead you to develop the ring shank nail. Um, so that's one nice way to use the pew chart is to sort of combine projects or concepts uh, and help you do that in a way that works well. Are there any questions about the pew chart? Because you're going to use it in 10 minutes. OK. And this is just, there it is. Um, another tool that's common that you might want to use is when you're developing a schedule, people often use something called a Gantt chart. And I know you can't read most of what's on here. But basically, you have your list of tasks, how long they're going to take, and then you sort of spread them out. And the thing that's important or helpful about a Gantt chart is listing the tasks that rely on each other. So if one of your tasks is, say, you're doing that rice husking and you need a mill, and you hadn't bought that mill, you have to order a mill and it have to be here. And you can't do any testing with your mill until it gets here. And so that's on the critical path because you need to do the testing. And therefore, um, that means you need to order it yesterday. <laughs> and it's a good thing you bought it. So, um, so that's really helpful. This is a helpful way to think about your schedule. Um, it's not a requirement in this class to use a Gantt chart. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But you can Google it and find lots of different tools. But it's just one way of building your schedule that works pretty well. So some of the best practices for doing the design process are, one, to have people assigned to different roles. So some roles that work really well are someone who's in charge of your timeline. So are you hitting those dates that you outlined on your schedule? And regardless, what can we do right now? So if you're waiting for that mill to arrive or whatever you've ordered to arrive, it can be really tempting to be like, oh, there's nothing to do today. It'll be here on Friday, and I won't do anything until then. And that's really dangerous because time is so tight. And so figuring out what can we do right now, even if it's not on the critical path, just to make sure we're moving forward. Um, and then having someone else who's making sure 
that what you're doing is actually related to your goal. Because it can be easy to get really involved in figuring out the perfect adhesive and doing an adhesive analysis when your goal is just to have a good enough adhesive and you should have used the first one you found um, and go with it or whatever. Um, and then having someone who's the key person on your team who's in charge of communicating with your community partner. For this class, I'm going to ask that you try to communicate with your partner once a week. Some of you may have a hard time doing that, but you should at least be trying to communicate once a week um, so that you're getting regular feedback. And then finally, documentation, making sure that um, you're documenting what you do well, which you'll, you'll really thank yourselves for at the end of the class when you have to write a final report as a team. The more documentation you do ahead of time, the easier that'll be. And then general recommendations are failing fast <laughs> is one. And so it's much better to figure out that your idea doesn't work today than it is the day before your presentation, right? And so the sooner you can be developing stuff so that you can figure out those failures and fixing them, the better. Um, and so along those lines, prototyping early and often. Um, and then finally, identifying any of your deal breakers immediately. So any physical impossibilities or things that are just not going to work, figuring those out as soon as possible so that you don't get into um, failing spectacularly, but only failing in small areas that you can re recover from. Oh, I don't know why these slides are like this. I'm sorry, guys. I should have run through it um, ahead of time. I didn't think it would be in there. Um, anyway, so I picked one of the design processes to sort of run us through what we're doing. And we're basically doing each stage of the design process in a week, which is ridiculously fast. Um, but it's why the pressure is on automatically, right, <laughs> like from today. Um, because this is all the time we have. Your final presentation is on May 7th, which is a Saturday. It's in your syllabus. So if um, you aren't free on that day, you should talk to me real soon. Um, but we're doing them as, as a group with the other D-Lab classes. Um, and so that's six weeks total is what we have. And so everything we're doing is, uh, you know, is basically we have a week for each stage, which is very rapid. And that really drives what your project should be. So as you, as you probably noticed when I showed last year's projects, none of them were inventing a brand new washing machine, say. It was making a very small incremental improvement on something. And that's what you want to do, because it's much better to have a really awesome small incremental improvement that'll actually help your organization and be a benefit than to make very small progress on a really big project that's not going to help anyone because you haven't completed it by the end of the semester. So um, I've, revi I've created like a part two syllabus, which I'll hand out as soon as I pick them up from the copier. Um, but basically. Uh, it has what we're doing um, each day, and then the assignments due, and then below this, the schedule is a bunch of details about each assignment. So hopefully everything will be super clear, but things to know is that there's a lot of time that's unscheduled where I'm not going to be lecturing at all, Amit's not going to be lecturing at all, it's just time for your team to work. That doesn't mean you should blow off class. Um, we're still checking attendance, we still expect you to be here. Um, the work time is pretty valuable. Amit and I will be stopping by each team every session at least once to check in on how you're doing. Your mentors will be stopping by almost every session to check in and help you. So it's a, a good time to work um, where you know your team members are available, where it's out of class time. It's harder to get everyone together in a group. Um, and so along those lines, if you're not going to be working in this classroom, your team should leave a note where you are so that as Amit and I are doing our rounds, we can find you. Um, so again, we actually do expect you to be here. Um, and then second is you're going to be creating a wiki page. The, there's a wiki link off of the Stellar website. Um, and so each team should have a wiki page where you can um, document your design process. So rather than having physical design notebooks, which get really challenging in terms of you want them with you at all times, I need to take them to grade you. Grade them. DLab has started doing wikis so that we can do grading without stealing your design notebooks and stuff like that. So that's where you should document everything. Um, and it's also useful for class future classes, they get to see everything that you're worked on. So um, that can be helpful. Um, and then there will be a design review on April 22nd, where you'll have 10 minutes to present your project. Um, and we'll have people from outside the class coming to give feedback. Um, and there you'll want to have a prototype. And I'll talk more about that as it gets closer. And then the final presentations where you'll, it's sort of this combo where you're both doing a public presentation that'll be one minute along with like a poster session. That's what you're used to if you've done previous D-Lab classes in the spring. And then also doing a more formal design review where you'll leave the poster session and have a formal design review in a separate room um, as well. 
we used to do those separately, and we're trying to combine them just for um, efficiency's sake. And then finally, I'll have a final report, um, which is written up well here, and then I'll go through more as we get closer. Um, so what are we doing now? Uh, you guys need to finalize what your actual projects are going to be. Um, and so what I'd like you to do is sort of come up with your top n projects, um, hopefully at least three um, and less than or no more than six, I would say, would be a good range. Um, and do a pew chart with them uh, so that you can come up with the best, um, figure out what projects are worth working on. Um, and you should come up with like one or two are the ones that you recommend going ahead with. Um, and then at 2.30, which, wow, I don't know if I'm able to do micro presentations because things went long. Um, so probably we'll just have you do the, um, just by the end of class, you need to hand in to me what are your top couple projects with a little description that you can email me so that every t everyone can know what they're working on. Um, but hopefully, you're not too far afield from what you just presented so people have a general idea of what you're working on. So before you go, I let you go, I just want to do one last thing, which is um, what few criteria we should be using, because you can have some variation. So what are the criteria you think we should use? Yeah, so your budget is about $500. Um, so um, you definitely don't want to be do, inv inventing anything that's going to require $50,000. Uh, what else? So what if we like, get funding? Like, what if our project like, is an awesome idea? Can we look for funding somewhere else? And yes, but um, you have six weeks. So um, you're unlikely to get funding for th in these six weeks there. Like if, if it's seven hundred dollars, you know, let's talk about what you actually need. Um, but most teams had budget left over last year when they had five hundred dollars. So um, I don't think this is a super high constraint. It just gives you an order of magnitude. Um, yeah. So what else? Materials availability. Yeah. So I think a bigger like general one is like do you mean like locally? Yeah. Like yeah. There. So then like um, so that that would probably be something more specific for different examples uh, or different um, projects. Like if you have a, like twelve ideas for your um, rice husker, um, but I think for here, like one that's along those lines is just does it help um, your community? And w embedded in that is if they can't build it, it's not going to help them, right? So, but we're looking at very broad strokes at this level. Any others? Can we finish it in six weeks? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so, um, si se puede, right? We want to be able to say that. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's pretty important to be able to say, yes, we can. Um, my son is really into Bob the Builder, and that's all I hear is, can we build it? Yes, we can. So, um, and then one other that's important to me is that is relevant to the energy class, um, which I think they all are. Um, but in, like a, a water project might be really compelling. It's not relevant to energy. Um, so you want to make sure that it does actually fit within the boundaries of the class, but they're pretty broadly defined. Um, so these are the four that I really want to make sure you include, that you might want to add others as well, but every team should include these. Um, are there any questions? So I'm going to grab um, the syllabus, the revised syllabi, um, and the project description, uh, and the um, big paper that you can use to make few charts on. And that's what you should, what you should be doing. Um, and by the end of the class, you need to have um, top projects. So great.